Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my full review of the Canon RF 600 and 800mm f11, a pair of relatively compact, light, and affordable super telephoto lenses for the full frame EOS R mirrorless system. For this review, I tested final production samples of both lenses, along with an RF 1.4x teleconverter, all on an EOS R6 body and all running the latest firmware. In this review, you'll see how both lenses perform when photographing birds in good and poor light, as well as sports, lunar, and even portrait or landscape shots. As always, if you find my reviews useful, the best way to support me is with a like and a follow. Thanks, and now on with the review. The RF 600mm measures just 200mm long and costs around $700 or pounds, while the RF 800mm measures 282mm long and costs around $900 or pounds. This makes both lenses more portable and lower priced than most super telephotos, not to mention most big zooms, and during my tests I was easily able to hike with both models plus a body in a medium sized backpack. Their secret is employing an extending barrel design and a modest f11 aperture, but don't be alarmed as on modern mirrorless cameras that's actually a lot more practical than it sounds. I'm going to explain all of that with lots of examples, but first a quick look at the design of each model, starting with the RF 600mm, a remarkably compact lens that measures just 93 by 200 mm when retracted and weighs 930 grams. For operation you need to twist a locking ring, pull the body away, then lock it again for use. You'll see a warning on screen if you try to use it unextended or unlocked. When extended, the lens becomes 270mm long, but that's still less than a foot and it remains well balanced when mounted using its built-in tripod foot. In terms of controls, there's a switch to limit the focus to 12 meters, a wide manual focusing ring, and the RF clickable custom ring at the end. Now, it's not an L lens, but Canon still supplies a substantial lens hood, and the filter thread is 82mm. Oh, and the closest focusing distance on this model is 45 meters. If you fancy longer reach, the 600 works with both the RF 1.4 and 2x teleconverters. This is the 1.4x version which extends the focal length to 840mm and reduces the aperture to f16. With the lens barrel extended and the hood fitted, the RF 600mm becomes unsurprisingly long, but remove the hood and retract the barrel and you're left with an impressively portable system. Now for the RF 800mm, which at 102 by 282 mil and 1260 grams is inevitably heftier than the 600, but it's still very portable, again, less than a foot long when retracted. Like the 600mm, you'll need to twist the locking ring and pull the body away, which extends the barrel to 352mm, then twist it again to lock it for use. Again, there's a focus limiter switch, this time to 20 meters, a smooth manual focusing ring and a clicky custom ring, and as before, a substantial lens hood is supplied. The filter thread this time is 95mm and the closest focusing distance is 6 meters. For maximum reach, you can fit either of the new RF teleconverters, and this time I'm showing the 2 times model, which doubles the focal length to 1600mm, albeit also reducing the aperture to f22. Now, an aperture of f22 sounds absolutely hopeless in traditional terms, but again, on a modern mirrorless camera, it works a lot better than you first assume. Before going any further, I should add that neither lens is sealed against dust or moisture, not even including a rubber ring at the mount, which could prove limiting in poor conditions. That said, as you can see, I used both lenses several times during showers with no obvious ill effects that I could see, but I made sure I dried the extending portion of each barrel before retracting them. Now, only time will tell if the extending section proves to be a weak point in the future, so if you own either lens and have had bad experiences, do let us know in the comments. In another move to keep the cost and the weight down, both lenses may include built-in tripod feet, but sadly don't go as far as offering a collar to rotate the lens while it's mounted. As a consequence, shooting in the portrait or tall shape will prove challenging from a tripod, even with the help of a locking pin in the foot. But the biggest elephant in the room is of course that f11 aperture on both lenses and if you're coming from a DSLR this will ring alarm bells for three main reasons. First, the view will be very dim through an optical viewfinder. Second, older cameras will struggle or even refuse to autofocus at all at this aperture. And third, small apertures will demand the use of higher ISOs to compensate, particularly if you need to keep that shutter speed high to freeze any motion. But modern mirrorless cameras can address those first two issues with fair success. First, the brightness of screens and electronic viewfinders can simply be increased, and while this can also see noise levels or lag increase as well, I actually found the view with the R6 remained perfectly usable in my tests, even during dusk or rain showers. 
Secondly, the EOS R bodies are all able to autofocus pretty well with f11 lenses and given enough light will continue to autofocus at f16 and even at f22 when the teleconverters are fitted. At f11 or smaller though, the autofocus area on the R bodies is reduced from the full frame to a large square box in the middle that, to be fair, covers a similar area to the viewfinder autofocus systems of many DSLRs. Within that area, the R5 and R6 are able to deploy their full AF technologies including eye detection for animals, but if the subject strays outside, you'll no longer be able to focus on it. So like shooting with DSLRs, you have to be more careful with framing to achieve autofocus. Also notice the hand icon at the top indicating stabilisation, but it's not the enhanced plus version of all other native RF lenses to date. Now the RF 600 and 800mm do include optical stabilisation and Canon claims it's good for up to 4 stops of compensation. In my own tests I managed 3 to 4 stops so it's useful but not amazing and the fact that it doesn't work in a perfectly coordinated way with the built in stabilisation is why they don't earn that plus symbol. I'll discuss autofocus in much more detail in just a moment. The third issue is shooting at high ISOs and while I chat I'll show you some examples I took during my tests. Now, there's no getting away from the fact that if you have an f11 lens, or slower still if you're using the TCs, then you'll be relying on higher sensitivities than normal with an inevitable loss of quality as a result. Even when mostly static subjects like landscapes allowed me to reduce the shutter speeds, I was rarely operating below 640 ISO, even in broad daylight. And once my shutter was increased to freeze action, like birds in flight, I was regularly around 1600 ISO in daylight and beyond 10,000 ISO once the light fell. At dusk or in very shaded areas, 25,600 ISO was not uncommon. This is inevitable, but the question is whether your images are acceptable at these sensitivities. Modern full frame sensors have come a long way and as you'll see in these examples the R6 may be delivering greater detail and cleaner results than you expected at these ISOs. As to whether it's good enough for you personally is another matter and only you can decide. The bottom line though is if you want to maintain high shutter speeds at lower ISOs you simply need more light and if you can't change the conditions that means faster lenses and they're neither cheap nor light to carry. Ok, now let's look at image quality across the frame and since neither lens is able to close its aperture further, it will be a mercifully short section. You're looking at the RF 600mm f11 on the R6 here and zooming in reveals a well corrected image with lots of fine detail. Now here's the RF 600mm fitted with the RF 1.4x teleconverter for an 840mm equivalent field of view, albeit now operating at f16. Taking a closer look shows there's perhaps a little less bite than before, but also a little bit more detail in there, although as always, the issue of rising heat will limit the ultimate potential of using long lenses over long distances like these. Now switching to the RF 800mm f11 on the R6, and again the results can look great, sharp across the frame, although again with the caveats of heat rising and the depth of field even at f11. I realise few would relish shooting at f16 or f22, but I'd have liked to be able to close the aperture a little bit to increase the depth of field sometimes. When fitted with the RF 1.4x converter, the 800 is transformed into an 1120mm f16 lens, and as before there's a minor reduction in contrast, but still potential for a little finer detail. Again, the biggest limiting factor for detail over long distances is the heat rising. While it's easy to dismiss super telephotos for distant landscape shots though, I actually love the effect they can have on otherwise familiar scenes. Here's a small selection I took around Brighton, where the highly compressed perspective and magnified distant details add up to a refreshingly different result. Again though, I wish I could have closed the aperture further to boost the depth of field in some situations. Speaking of depth of field, it's also easy to assume that there's little or no chance of blurring effects at f11, but if the background's sufficiently far behind the subject, you will enjoy some separation. To be fair, it's fairly easy for me to find distant backgrounds when photographing along the coast, but once you're in deeper foliage like woodlands or even trees in your garden, it's inevitable that backgrounds will become busier and more distracting. Again, it is what it is. If you want more blurring under the same conditions, you'll need a faster lens that's heavier and much more expensive. While low light wildlife photographers may scoff at f11 telephotos, they're perfectly adequate for other types of subjects including air shows. Now at the time of testing there was nothing particularly exciting in my local skies, but here's a helicopter passing overhead, uncropped, with the RF 800mm for some sort of idea of what you can achieve. Lunar and solar photography are also well within the capabilities of small aperture telephotos, after all they're not much different from telescopes are they? 
Here's the moon uncropped with the RF 600mm, and now with the RF 1.4x teleconverter where it's working at 840mm f16. For comparison, here's the RF 800mm at f11, and now that same lens with the RF 1.4x converter for an equivalent of 1120mm at f16. Now these were all uncropped for comparison, but as I can't resist taking a closer look at craters, here's the four images once again, but magnified to the same degree, again for comparison. I was impressed by the degree of detail on both lenses, and they're ideal for high power work. Oh, and just for fun, here's a snap of Mars with the RF 800mm and 1.4x teleconverter. It's understandably small even when you zoom in on it a lot, but you can still just about see some different surface colours, including the hint of a polar cap. Distance sports are also ideal for super telephotos, although to maintain fast shutter speeds you'll need reasonable light levels, and again those high ISOs. That said, these quick bursts of wakeboarding and practice windsurfing were taken during a rain shower at around 3200 ISO in order to achieve a 2000th of a second shutter speed. If you're feeling really ambitious, you could even try filming a walkie-talkie to camera. Not quite vlogging material, but hey, at least I showed you that it works. So let's move on to the next bit. Living on the coast, my primary targets for super telephotos are of course seagulls, and during my tests I was able to try out both RF lenses in midday and dusky conditions, as well as during light showers. I already knew the animal eye detection on the R5 and R6 worked to treat with shorter, brighter telephotos, so I wondered how the experience would compare with longer and dimmer lenses. The answer was unsurprisingly not quite as well, but still very usable indeed. I assumed that focus or light levels would be ever-present issues, but under fair conditions they effectively disappeared, and the biggest challenge was keeping the erratic motion of the birds inside the square AF area at long focal lengths, especially in blustery windy conditions. But even if they strayed within that AF box for a split second, the RF would snap into focus and allowed me to fire off a few well-focused frames with ease. Now to put it in perspective, the R6 does currently represent the best case scenario for focusing in the initial four ESR bodies, operating in light levels down to minus 6.5 EV. Compare that to minus 6 EV on the EOS R and EOS R5, or minus 5 EV on the EOS RP. So those other models will find it harder to keep focusing as the light levels fall, but I still found the R6 happily locked onto animal and bird eyes even at dusk. The biggest issue in low light is the highest sensitivity you're willing to use. Even at 25,600 ISO, I had to reduce my shutter speed to 125th of a second as the light fell and had to switch to animals that, well, kept mostly still. Again, if you need faster shutters or lower ISOs in very low light conditions, these are not the lenses for you. Just before my final verdict, here's a selection of videos I filmed with both lenses on the R6, starting with a bunch in 4K at normal speed, followed by some slow motion at 1080 100p. Right, I'll see you in a minute.
The Canon RF600 and 800mm f11 are relatively light and affordable super telephoto lenses for the full frame EOS R mirrorless system. They exploit mirrorless technology and stripped down designs to achieve their compact size without overly compromising performance. An aperture of f11 may ring alarm bells on older cameras, but the SR bodies can autofocus at f11 or even at f16 or f22 when using teleconverters in all but the dimmest conditions, while the brightness of their electronic viewfinders automatically increase to avoid the dim image you'd get with a DSLR. Meanwhile, a non-adjustable aperture and a fixed tripod foot rather than a rotating collar allow the weight and cost to be kept down. In practice, both lenses prove remarkably usable, successfully tracking birds in flight and various sports in good to fair conditions, while also proving more than capable for aviation or lunar photography. The f11 aperture does however prove limiting at dusk or in shaded areas, inevitably bumping you up to the highest sensitivities while also delivering modest blurring on closer backgrounds. Ultimately, it is what it is. If you want a shallower depth of field or to maintain faster shutters or lower ISOs in dim light, Canon has plenty of options. The EF 600mm f4 and EF 800mm 5.6 are three and two stops brighter than these RF versions, but they're twice as long, three times heavier and roughly 15 times more expensive. The RF models are not designed to compete with either of them, but to provide lighter and much cheaper alternatives. They won't deliver the shallow depth of field of expensive super telephotos, nor work as well in low light, but equally they won't break your back or your bank. Ultimately, there are plenty of long telephotos for Canon owners, including the native RF 100-500, not to mention a selection of big zooms from Sigma, but few offer the reach, portability or affordability of the RF 600 and 800 mil. I love that they're exploiting modern camera technologies to provide something genuinely new. They may not suit high-end wildlife photographers, but for the rest of us, open up a world that until now was literally out of reach. So what do you think of the RF 600 800mm? If we're talking about very affordable and compact super telephotos, you may remember those old budget mirror telephoto models that were cheap, but with manual focus, dim to compose on an SLR and with horrible donut shaped bokeh. Now these new RF lenses are a world apart, allowing you to capture fast action with sharp results, especially coupled with the autofocus and burst modes of the latest EOS R bodies. In fact, mount them on an R5 or an R6 and you've got a seriously impressive setup for wildlife photography that you'd be more than happy to take on a long hike. Right, if you found any of this useful, don't forget to like and make sure you're subscribed to see all my latest reviews and tutorials. And as always, if you'd like to support my work, you can always shout me a coffee or treat yourself to my in-camera photography book. There's links for everything, including the latest prices for the lenses in the description and pinned comment below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.